to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and i brethren could not speak to you as spiritual but to as carnal, as babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. Welcome to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Today's lesson deals with the heart of the message to the church in Corinth in which Paul shows them that their spiritual immaturity has led to a host of problems. How sad it is that sometimes Christians, even those who've been in the Lord's body for many years, are no longer acting like adults, but are acting like spiritual babies. Notice the text of 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 4. Look, look at Paul's encouragement to these Christians. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now, even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of a Paul, I'm of Paul, and another says, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? Paul says the main problem here in Corinth is you're acting like babes, you're focusing on the carnal, the worldly, and not the spiritual, and you haven't grown up in Christ like you ought to. Again, the Hebrew reminder, writer reminded the Christians of how they had strayed from where they should have been by not growing. Hebrew writer said, by this time, you ought to be teachers, and yet you need someone to teach you again the first principles, the oracles of God. You've come to need milk when you ought to be on solid food, he said. Shame on us when we as Christians ought to be mature and know how to deal with problems. Instead, we revert back to acting like babies. Now, how is it that some Christians act like babies today? Here's how. Some Christians need milk by the time when they ought to be eating solid food. You know, a baby has to start out on milk. And the Bible says that we as newborn Christians ought to start out on milk. 1 Peter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes, we desire the pure milk of the Word, but we don't remain on the milk, that we may grow thereby. But some in the Lord's body act like babes in Christ because they always stay on that milk. They never move on to solid food. The Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 6 verse 1, you need to go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations of Christianity for you, but you need to go on to deeper things. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, Matthew 5 verse 6. If we're going to grow up in Christ, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. We need to get into the Scriptures daily. Acts chapter 17, verse 11, and not studying the same old things we've always studied, but launching out into the deep, Matthew 4, verse 4, and breaking up our fallow ground, Hosea 5 and verse 12, so that we can reach more people who may not have a good understanding beyond the fundamentals of Christianity. Well, how else are some Christians like babies? Not only do they stay on the bottle, some Christians act like babies because they whine and complain and cry when they don't get their way. Do you remember what Paul said in Philippians 2 verses 14 and 15? Paul said, do all things without murmuring and complaining. The Christian is not to be a crybaby, not to murmur and whine and complain every, th every time something doesn't go his way. We're to consider other people. Philippians 2 verses 3 and 4. We're not to put ourselves above everybody else, Romans 14, but we're at sometimes even to look out for the weaker brother. The Israelites learned the lesson the hard way about whining and complaining. Do you remember after God took them out of that Egyptian bondage, walked them through the Red Sea on dry ground, delivered them from Pharaoh and the Egyptians, even, even defeated their enemies? 
when they're out headed toward that Exodus event in Exodus chapter 14, the Mount Sinai event, when they're walking toward Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 15 and 16, weren't they really thankful? Oh, not at all. As you read the text in Exodus 16, they in essence say, What have you done, God? Have you brought us out here to this desert to make us starve to death? Oh, how we wish we were back by the flesh pots in Israel where at least we had food to eat. What have you done? Brought us out here to starve us? Look at their lack of faith, and it's that lack of faith that caused them to wander for 40 years and caused their bodies to die in the wilderness not seeing the promised land. Friend, are we any different? From those folks in the Old Testament, when we whine and we complain and we act like crybabies when things don't go our way. How else are sometimes Christians like babies? You know, sometimes we just can't be satisfied. You know, a baby, when it gets in a temper tantrum or when it doesn't get its way, no matter what you give it, no matter what you say to it, no matter how you react to it, it just can't be satisfied. Sometimes Christians are like that. They can't be satisfied with God and the pure principles of Christianity. We we'll always have to be looking for something new or something more entertaining or something more exciting. We need to take comfort in the fact that Christianity is all that we need. Christ is our all in all. Colossians chapter 1 and 2 teaches us that. But also sometimes Christians act like babies in that they're asleep. A lot of the time. You know, you can tell a baby, especially a newborn baby, because it spends more time sleeping than it does awake. I wonder if that applies to Christians today. Are we sometimes asleep at the wheel? Are we sometimes asleep uh, there in a daze when we ought to be out working in the kingdom? Sometimes we're, not, we're aloof to the opportunities that are there for us to grab hold of. God may set those in front of us, and if we're asleep at the wheel, we're no different than a baby. We need to realize now is the time to work. John 9 verse 4, we must work the works of Him who sent us while it is day. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58 following, we're to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Those whose death is blessed in Revelation 14, verse 13, are those whose works and labors follow them. And so let's not be like babies and be asleep. And let's sure not be like children or babies and play favorites. You know, you can tell a child or a baby because they always seem to play favorite. They have a favorite they like to be around. How sad it is when some are saying, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas. Christians don't play favorites among men. We put Christ on the preeminent pedestal, Colossians 1 verse 18, and we do not allow others to receive glory that only God and Christ deserve. And so the main problem of Corinth, they were acting like babies, and how we today need to look to ourselves and ask, are we too at times guilty of being spiritual babies? Now, one of the problems they had, as we've alluded to, is that they were putting a lot of emphasis on the preachers, the workers, those who stood up and preached the gospel, those who went out and did personal work. And in reality, Paul's going to say, you don't need to put the, the preacher on a pedestal. He's simply a minister or a servant of the Word, and you need to put the emphasis on God who gives the increase. Paul says the preacher is just a minister, a servant in verse 5. Gospel preachers are no different than any other Christian. They've just been given the privilege to speak the Word. Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus, the greatest gospel preacher you could ever imagine, said this, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give His life a ransom for all. Luke 19, 10, the Bible teaches that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Friend, the gospel preacher is just privileged to preach the word, to spread the message, but he's not on a higher level. There is no clergy laity system, big me and little you. As one gospel preacher said, we all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Well, where does the emphasis need to be then? If you notice 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 and 7, the emphasis needs to be upon God who gives the increase. Paul's going to say, I may have watered or Paulus may have watered, but it's God who gives the increase. Sure, Paul went into the region of Corinth in Acts chapter 18. He preached the gospel. He was even instrumental in teaching Apollos some principles he didn't understand. Acts 18 verses 24 through 27. But Paul couldn't take credit. Apollos couldn't take credit. Why not? They preached the gospel, didn't they? Well, my friends, they did nothing 
to give the increase. The seed is the Word of God, Luke 8 verse 11, and it is that seed set in the hearts and lives of men and women that gives the increase, and God is the source of that. I want you to notice Acts chapter 2. Here's what's distinct about New Testament Christianity. Notice the words of Acts chapter 2 verse 47. Peter has just preached the gospel to them. He has convicted them of sin. They're cut to the heart. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer is you need to repent and be baptized. Those who received his word were baptized. Verse 41. And notice what happened to those same people in verse 47. The scripture says, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. Paul didn't add them to the church. Apollos didn't add them to the church. And men and women today cannot even if they wanted to add people to the church. Why? God deserves the glory. He's the one who gives the increase. No matter how great a sermon may be, no matter how much oratory skill a person may have, they don't deserve the honor or glory. It's God who gives the increase. Jesus is the one who tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2 and verse 9. He's the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours alone, for the whole world. When we preach the gospel, what have we really done? Nothing. We've just preached that which has already happened, which is accomplished in the first century by Jesus, the Son of God. Is there power in preaching? Yes. As long as 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 is applied. We preach the cross of Christ and Him crucified. But you know what's interesting about 1 Corinthians 3? Not only should gospel preachers not be elevated to a state they don't deserve, but all Christians are considered by God as fellow workers in the kingdom. Notice the text of 1 Corinthians 3, and look at what the Bible says in verse 9. Paul says, For we, who all Christians, we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. Every Christian has a responsibility. The idea of a Christian who does nothing is foreign to the New Testament. Christianity, by its very nature, when I obey the gospel, I give my body to God, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, and I commit to daily walk after the Savior's pattern. That being true, all Christians are fellow workers with God, with Christ in the kingdom. Remember again John 9, verse 4, the blind man said, we've got to work the works of Him who sent us while it's day. That time, that day is now. And oh, how we need to be busy. In Matthew chapter 20, the, the church is likened to a vineyard. And here's what's interesting about that. A vineyard is a place of work where fruit is produced. If the church is a vineyard and the church is made up of the saved, then those saved people need to be out working and producing fruit to God to give Him the glory and the honor. And so while gospel preachers may be layers of the foundation, preachers of the Word, the foundation of the church, my friends, is none other than Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.11, Paul said this, No other foundation can any man lay except that which is laid. And the idea is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Oh yes, we may preach the Word and we may lay the foundation out for people to see, but we didn't build the church. It's not our church. The foundation of the church is Jesus Himself. He is the chief cornerstone. In Acts chapter 4, the Jews are questioning John uh, there and questioning those who are working with them. And they asked Peter and John, by what authority, by what power have you done these things? And they respond by saying, it's in the name of Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone whom you've left out in essence of your spiritual superstructure. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the foundation, the pillar, the stone. Isaiah 28 verse 16 that the church is built upon. You remember John 14, verse 6? Here's the, here's the essence of why it's essential that Christ be at the center. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Hebrews 7, verses 25 and 26, the Hebrew writer said, He's able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him since He ever lives to make intercession for them. My friends, if we try to lay another foundation, 1 Corinthians 3 and 4 teaches that foundation and those who built upon it will one day be burned up. It will not stand the test of time, but if we lay the foundation of Jesus, 
then it will stand because it's the solid rock foundation. Matthew 7 verses 24 through 27. Now, there is a practical application here, a very practical application. If Jesus is the founder and the foundation of the church, is it possible for men to come along 1,500, 2,000 years later and found another church? There's only one church in the Bible, Ephesians 4, verse 4, Matthew 16, verse 18. It's the church of Jesus Christ, Romans 16, verse 16. And if men come along 1,500 or 2,000 years after Jesus has already established His church and lay another foundation, claim themselves to be the founders, name it after themselves, is that really the foundation God intended? It, can that be the church? You read about in the New Testament? My friends, the answer is absolutely not. Jesus is the only founder of the church. And since Jesus is the founder of the church, notice how we play a role in that. Christians are part of God's temple today in that our bodies belong to Him. We, as individual members, are part of the temple of God. Look at 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Paul says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8 says that, again, we have the Holy Spirit. Acts 5 verse 32. In Ephesians 1, he is identified as the seal or guarantee. Colossians 3 verse 16, we're to let the words of Christ dwell in us richly. Ephesians 5 verse 18, we're to be filled with the Spirit, singing to one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. What does all that teach us? If we're the temple of God and if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, it must do so by the medium of the Word of God. John 16, verse 13, that's how the Holy Spirit revealed Himself and His will was through the Word of God, through men and women in the first century. And so when we talk about being a temple of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about Christians who've been sanctified, who've put the Word of God into their life and are living it out. They are the place where God's Spirit resides as long as they have the Word, the medium by which the Spirit resides in them. Now, we're not saying anything miraculous. We're not saying God is whispering to us or talking to us. Simply as the Word of God lives in our lives, as we apply its teaching, as we live by its principles, that's how the Holy Spirit indwells Christians today through the Word. Now, is there a practical application here? Sure there is. It's, it's a very practical application. If we are the temple of God and He, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us through the Word, then my friends, we must never, ever do anything to defile our body. Think about how important it is to God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20 says, Our body belongs to God. Let's make it more practical than that. You would never want to do anything to your body that would cause undue harm and that would disgrace the Lord and the Holy Spirit. That means this. You don't want to do drugs. Drugs are going to harm your body more than you ever know. You're bringing things into it that are poison to your body. Alcohol, you don't want to take alcohol into your body. It, it destroys your brain cells. It causes you to do things with the body that you may not even know about. You want to behave yourself in a sexually pure way if we are the temple of God. That means that all sexual relations outside of the marriage bond are sinful. Hebrews 13 verse 4, marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God's going to judge. Don't do anything to, impure, to make your body impure sexually. That means that things such as smoking cigarettes or dipping tobacco are things that are sinful because they will harm your body. They've been proven to cause cancer, to cause lung problems, something that's not healthy for you, that you are unnaturally bringing in your body. I'm not talking about breathing air, some air that may be polluted. That's not what we're talking about here. You've got to breathe. But friends, you don't have to take a puff on a cigarette and bring that into your lungs. That's a choice you make. And when you make that, when you make that knowing that that's harmful to your body, you have done something to the temple of God which you shouldn't have. Now, let's make it a more, little more practical. Gluttony is a sin that is just as wrong as drugs and impurity in your sexual life and smoking. When we bring more food into our body in a gluttonous way than we ought to and we just eat and eat and eat and have to stuff ourselves and our heart can't handle it and our blood vessels can't handle it, and have we really dealt with the temple of God as He wants us to? You know, laziness would also 
be a way in which we're not dealing properly with the temple of God. If we allow ourselves to become so lethargic and so lazy that we can't do anything but sit on the couch, then my friends, have we really dealt with the temple of God in the way He wants us to? Let's think about these things. Let's examine ourselves and see, can't we improve our own body and its use for the kingdom of God by not doing some of these things? Now, here's another principle that Paul makes concerning the body of Christ, and it's this. Christians belong to Christ, and ultimately, they belong to God. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 23. Paul has already said, we're the temple of God, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. But look at 1 Corinthians 3, and I want you to notice what Paul says in verse 23. You are Christ, very simply, you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Now, friends, as a Christian, I belong to God. My life belongs to Him. Everything that I have belongs to Him. My time, my money, my energy, everything that I have has been given to me by the giver of all good gifts. James 1 verse 17. That being the case, how I need to spend my life glorifying God. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, then Paul teaches us not only are we faithful uh, stewards of God, but we're faithful servants of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, And as faithful servants of Christ and stewards of the gospel, we must never ever go beyond what's written in Scripture. I, I'm a faithful steward of the Word. I'm a servant of Christ. What's that mean? I've got to stick with the book. I want you to notice especially 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at the admonition of verse 6. Don't miss this. This is a powerful principle for New Testament Christianity. Notice what the scripture says. Paul has here figuratively transferred some things to himself and Apollos. He says, for your sakes, now notice this, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. Paul portrayed some things figuratively so people would hear the message but, but message but here was the point he said i did this so that you could learn by what we have figuratively transferred into ourselves as an example not to go beyond what's written what's the principle for us my friends, if you want to find New Testament Christianity, if you want to be a Christian like they were in the first century, do this. Make up your mind. I'm not going to go beyond what's written. Can you imagine the plethora of problems that would solve? If we said to ourselves, here's the boundary. I'm not going beyond what's written in the book. I'm only going to stick with the Word of God. And for New Testament Christians under the new law, Matthew through Revelation is where we find God's directives for salvation and worship for us today. Proverbs 30 verse 6 says this, Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Paul was amazed at some in the region of Galatia, for they were so soon turning away from him who called them into the gospel of Christ to another gospel. Paul says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And here's his encouragement. He said, even if we or an angel from heaven bring to you or preach to you any other gospel, don't believe it. Let him be accursed. Remember Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. We're not to add to nor take away from the things written in the book. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said this. Here's the standard we're going to be judged by. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words, he has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken in the last day will judge him in the last day. And so the words of Christ is what's going to judge us when I stand before God. I'm not accountable to the law of Moses. John 1 verse 17 says the law came through Moses, but grace and truth are in Christ. That law is a dead law, Romans 7 verse 4 for Christians, and that law, verse 7, contained the Ten Commandment Code. And so we're not bound by those laws, we're bound by the laws of Christ. Now, what questions then might we ask from 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 to make sure that we're really right with God? Any practice that you're about to partake in, any action you're about to do as far as a religious thing, here's what you ought to ask. Number one, where is that found out in the Bible? Where can I find support to do this in Scripture? Romans 14, the very last verse, verse 23 says, if it's not a faith, it's sin. And so I've got to ask, where is the support for this action, this teaching, this doctrine in the Bible? Does God approve of it? Or does God condemn it? If He approves of it, then I better do it. If He condemns it, then I surely want to stay away from it. And what is implied by the silence of the Scriptures on this subject? My friends, we talk about the silence of the Scripture. We're really talking about the voice of what God has said. For example, Hebrews 7 verse 14 
the writer concerning the uh, priesthood of the Levitical priesthood and Jesus not being of that tribe, the tribe of Levi, said this, of, of that tribe, of the tribe of Judah, he spoke nothing, implying that since God never said anybody from Judah could be a priest, that automatically excluded the whole tribe. Why? Because he did say people from the tribe of Levi would be priests. So when God said what he wanted, that excluded everything else. Now that applies very powerfully to the New Testament today. When God tells us what he wants, that's all he wants. I don't have to wonder. When God says sing, I don't have to wonder then, does he want a mechanical instrument also? Does he want me to play a flute? Does he want me to get a guitar? No. When God said sing, that's all he wants. We must never go beyond what's written in the scripture to please God. Now Paul also teaches us in 1 Corinthians 4 that we need to be people who are imitators of godly men and women. Imitate those things, Paul will say, which are good. Be imitators of the godly. If we're really going to follow the pattern of Christ and Christianity, we need to make sure that we're following the right things. And friend, the best advice we could ever give anyone, 1 Peter 2, verse 21, For this were you called, because Christ also suffered and died, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. Our encouragement to you, especially relating to the text of 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, where so many people were getting caught up in what men were teaching, maybe even their personalities and their speaking styles is this. Make sure your motto is to follow in the footsteps of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, I want you to imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Honestly ask yourself today, am I, have I been following in the footsteps of Christ? Am I a faithful child of God? Have I even obeyed the gospel? Maybe you've done what some preacher, no matter how good they may have sounded, told you to do. And maybe it's beyond or not found in Scripture. Friend, if that's the case, we encourage you today to obey the gospel, to become a New Testament Christian. You can hear the word, Romans 10, verse 17. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. Be willing to repent of sin in your life, Acts 3, verse 19. Confess the name of Christ before men, Romans 10, verse 10, and Acts chapter 8, verse 37 following. And be baptized for the remission of your sins. Here's what Peter said. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Have you done that? My friend, we kindly say to you today, if you've not obeyed the gospel, you're lost and you're headed down the road to hell, but you can change that by obeying God's will. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1 855 458 3905 or write to us 